pleasant morning, everyone. Welcome to the second Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture, Gut Fiber, a webinar on fiber as a functional food component to improve gut health. So to formally start our program, we would like to welcome our Regent of the College of Education, Reverend Father Maximo P. Gatella, OPPHL, for the opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, on the occasion of the second Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture of the Department of Food, Technology, and Dietetics, USC College of Education, we ask, we pray, for your presence to be implanted among us, to direct our thoughts and discussions, inspire our dialogues and conclusions, and to bring growth to our theories and hypotheses, especially as we tackle with the theme, a webinar on fiber as a functional food component to improve gut health. We place everything under your feet, O oh Lord, all the tasks, the presentations, the talks, and all the work behind the scene. At your feet, we lay before you the success of our endeavor. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Max. Let us now sing the Philippine National Anthem. Once again, good morning, everyone. I am Kat Crozada, the Chair of the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, and I will be your host for this webinar. We are streamed live via USD College of Education's YouTube channel. So if you have questions and comments later, kindly type it through the chat box so we can ask those to our speakers or for those who are on our YouTube channel, kindly uh, type your questions to our comment section. So again, we can ask those to our speakers during the open forum. And now for the opening remarks and, and to introduce to us who Mom Helen Ocampo is, let us welcome the Chair of the Food Technology Department, Ms. Essence Jean L. Castillo. Thank you, Mom Kat. To our dear region, Reverend Father Maximo P. Gatella OP, to our Dean, Associate Professor Dr. Pilar I. Romero, to our distinguished resource persons, our beloved alumni, academic officials of the university, colleagues in the department, faculty members and students, guests from our own university and other institutions, a pleasant morning. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You've probably heard this famous quote often attributed to Hippocrates, who was a Greek physician and known as the father of medicine. This quote may be thousands of years old already, but I know you would agree with me that this statement still holds true today. One of the keys to maintaining good health is through a healthy diet. And a healthy diet can include the consumption of functional foods. Functional foods are foods and food components that provide a health benefit beyond basic nutrition. 
they can prevent the risk of having various chronic diseases. Examples of which are green tea and cranberry juice, which contain polyphenols. Tomatoes and other cruciferous vegetables, which contain phytochemicals. These functional foods can reduce the risk of certain types of cancer. Another would be fermented food products, which contain probiotics or live good bacteria that supports gastrointestinal health and can boost immunity. And lastly, whole oats that contain soluble fiber and fish that contains omega-3 fatty acids can prevent the risk of having cardiovascular diseases since these bioactive compounds were proven to reduce the amount of low-density lipoprotein or LDL and cholesterol in our body. With our goal of promoting functional food research among our students and faculty, we are happy that we are able to continue this symposium on this topic on functional foods for a few years already. Just to share with you a little recap of the past topics that we had. In 2017, during the 91st celebration of the foundation anniversary of the College of Education, we had Professor Melissa Ann Fitzgerald from the University of Queensland Professor Wei Piao Cho from the National University of Singapore, Professor Maud Redzuan Sabran from University Putra, Malaysia, and the late Dr. Trinidad P. Trinidad as our guest speakers for the very first Food and Nutrition Science Colloquy on the notions, options, and directions of functional foods. In 2018, during the 92nd celebration, we invited Dr. Liu Xiaokuan from the National University of Singapore, Dr. Nagendra Prasad Shah from the University of Hong Kong, Dr. Luisito Lido from St. Luke's Medical Center, and Dr. Leslie Michelle Dalmacho from the University of the Philippines, Manila, to discuss about prebiotics and probiotics for optimal well being. Last 2019, we were privileged to have Dr. Ming Fu Wang from the University of Hong Kong and Dr. Harold Kork from Shanghai Chao Hong University in China. We also have Mr. James David Alcantara and Ms. Melissa Borlandan from the DOSP, Department of Science and Technology, Food and Nutrition Research Institute, to talk on polyphenols as functional food ingredients. And this functional food seminar that we had in 2019 was the start of the first Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture in commemoration of one of our professors in food and nutrition. This event was successfully launched with the help of BS Food Nutrition Batch 1973. And due to the success of this initiative, we are having this second Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture today, a webinar on fiber as a functional food component to improve gut health. This morning's discussions shall also focus on functional foods that reduces the risk of cardiovascular diseases. So we are glad, very glad, also to announce that this is the first time that we are streaming this activity live on the YouTube channel of the USC College of Education. Special thanks to our technical committee and to Ma'am Cherry Buendilla and to our USC EdTech support team. This event would also have not been possible without the efforts and hard work of the organizing committee the faculty members in the Department of Food Technology and the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics. They are the persons behind the execution of this webinar. Let us acknowledge them by giving a virtual round, warm round of applause. I would also like to thank the officers of the Philippine Association of Food Technologists, Epsilon Chapter, and Philippine Association of Nutrition Omega Chapter, for the assistance that you have extended for this activity. 
Most importantly, we are very grateful to have Dr. Edgarin Aguinaldo Lucas from Oklahoma State University to talk about weak germ, gut health, and the prevention of obesity and insulin resistance. And of course, last but not the least, Dr. Ajar Matiasa from University Science Malaysia to share his research on making noodles functional. Despite having a very busy schedule, thank you for thank you very much to the both of you for accepting our invitation and making time to share your experience on this topic to all of us this morning. And I know you are all excited to hear their lectures, but before that, they, let us look back on the memories and know more about Mom Helen Ocampo through this vid audiovisual presentation to be presented next. Again, good morning to all and enjoy the rest of this webinar. Thank you. One of the pillars in the success of the Nutrition and Food Technology Departments is no other than Professor Helen Ocampo. She was born on July 31, 1924. Professor Ocampo finished her Bachelor of Science in Education, major in Home Economics from the College of Education, University of Santo Tomas, in June 15, 1948, as cum laude. She was able to finish also her Master's degree in Education, from the Columbia University Teachers College in New York City, New York. After finishing her graduate studies, Professor Helen Ocampo started teaching in her alma mater, the University of Santo Tomas. In 1957, a new program known as Bachelor of Science in Foods and Nutrition was introduced in the College of Education of the University. During that time, Professor Helen Ocampo was one of the nutrition instructors. In 1975, she became the director of the Institute of Nutrition, Food Science, and Home Economics. In 1981, the BS Foods and Nutrition program was changed to BSND, or Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics. During that time, Professor Ocampo was assigned as the chairperson in charge of the Institute of Nutrition and Food Science, which comprised of the Food Technology Department and the Nutrition Department. As the chairperson, Professor Helen Ocampo managed also the nutrition cafeteria together with her colleague, Professor Juana Arenapil. As chairperson, she was the one who introduced special programs for students' development such as seminars and symposia. Professor Ocampo was also an energetic person. She worked very hard to improve both the nutrition and food technology departments. Such effort made the students to achieve most of the top 10 places in the board exams for nutritionist dietitians. At the same time, attaining the title as one of the best performing schools in the Philippines, in USD, students see Mamo Campo as a strict but kind, conservative, and a good professor. Likewise, her co professors see her as a kind hearted, travel oriented, organized, and a simple person. After serving the university for around 40 years, she died on June 3, 1992. She left the Nutrition and Food Sciences Department. But the memories of her goodness remained in the hearts and minds of her students and colleagues in the College of Education. Until now, the College of Education is continuously harvesting the seeds of success that were planted by Professor Helen Ocampo. Thank you, Ma'am Essence, for introducing to us Ma'am Helen Ocampo. And now, for our uh, first uh, speaker for the topic with germ, gut health, and the prevention of obesity and insulin resistance. To introduce our speaker, we have now Associate Professor Dr. Elizabeth H. Arenas. Good morning. I am greatly honored to have this opportunity to introduce our first speaker. An alumna of the USD College of Science, she is a graduate of BS Chemistry Batch 1986. Born and raised in a humble home here in the Philippines, she came to the United States in 1989 to study PhD in chemistry at the Oklahoma State University, where she also completed her postdoctoral fellowship. A teacher for 30 years, she was appointed full professor in 2016 
at the Nutritional Sciences Department of Oklahoma State University and now holds the Jim and Lynn Williams Endowed Professorship. She handles undergraduate courses such as Principles of Nutrition, Nutrition and Evidence-Based Practice, and teaches macronutrients, advanced human nutrition, experimental methods in nutritional sciences at the graduate level. Dr. Edgerlin is a multi-awarded teacher and researcher. She is a recipient of the Oklahoma State University Regents Distinguished Teaching and Research Awards. And last year, she received the prestigious Oklahoma Medal of Excellence in Teaching at a research university in recognition of her outstanding teaching performance and enduring commitment to student learning. Dr. Edrelin's major research interest is on the role of nutrition in promoting cardiovascular health and preventing chronic diseases. Her recent research activities include dry beans for the prevention of gut dysbiosis, maintenance of gut health and reduction of cardiovascular risk factors, pulse consumption for the improvement of gut health, metabolic outcomes and bone biomarkers, prebiotic activity of tart cherry and the immunoregulation of bone homostasis. Over the years, she has received more than $4.5 million of external grants to support her research endeavors. She has delivered paper presentations in professional conferences, including the ASN Nutrition Meeting, Experimental Biology, and the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research Annual Conference. She has given lectures on various topics ranging from osteoporosis, health benefits of mango, obesity, nutrition and immunology, phytoestrogens, and cardiovascular health. Presently, she sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Nutrition and Health, PLOS One, and the Journal of Obesity and Chronic Diseases and she regularly serves as a reviewer in several high impact journals. To date, she has authored about 80 scientific articles in peer reviewed journals and has published seven book chapters. Dr. Edgerlin is also active in professional activities. She is a member of the American Society of Nutritional Sciences, Sigma Psi Honor Society, American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, American Chemical Society, and the Phi Lambda Upsilon Honor Society. USD is indeed very proud of her as she embodies the formation core values of compassion, competence, and commitment. This morning, she will be talking about wheat germ, gut health, and the prevention of obesity and insulin resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Edraline Lucas. A virtual round of applause, please. Can I go? Uh, well, thank you so much for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you all today uh, some of the things that we do. And uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to 
spend the eve, uh, I guess, morning there uh, with you all. And again, uh, I'm extremely honored to be invited to be a speaker for uh, to the, uh, the second uh, memorial lecture. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, weak germ gut health and the prevention of obesity and insulin resistance. And as I have uh, mentioned earlier, I didn't prepare much uh, for this lecture as I have a proposal that was due a few hours ago. And so um, I guess we'll see how, how things come along. So before I discuss about uh, weed germ, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we do in our research group. So as I mentioned, I were interested in identifying uh, identifying food and understanding its role in preventing uh, risk factors for heart disease, such as diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, inflammation, oxidative stress, and recently we're looking at the gut bacteria. And as we all know, uh, the food that we eat, uh, our fruits and vegetables, doesn't only provide nutrients, but it also contains many other uh, phytochemicals that can enhance uh, its health benefits. And so in our research approach, we use uh, cell culture, we do animal study, and we also do clinical trials. So we do the whole thing from uh, bench to bedside in our research approach. And uh, some of the functional food that we have uh, studied are shown here. So we look at, uh, this is flaxseed, pinto beans, uh, tart cherry, and more in relation to the Philippines, we look at the bitter melon, watermelon. And as uh, mentioned, we also have funding to do research on mango. And as you can see here, uh, one of the uh, paper that my graduate student wrote was the feature article, I think this is 2016 in the Journal of Nutrition. And we also publish our human study. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, we're currently very interested in looking at the gut microbiota. So the bacteria within our gut, as we all know, is linked to uh, health. So why are we interested in obesity? Uh, as we all know, uh, that Obesity increases, uh, the prevalence of obesity is high in every country, it's increasing, it continues to increase, uh, not just in the US, but worldwide. So our change in eating habits, uh, eating ultra processed food and uh, sedentary lifestyle and excessive caloric intake has led to overweight and obesity, which is linked to many chronic diseases. In the Philippines, it's no exception. As you can see here, one in three uh, Filipinos are overweight or obese. So it's uh, not just a problem in the US, in developed countries, but also in underdeveloped countries. And also in the Philippines, uh, a lot of um, main cause of death in the Philippines is nutrition related. As you all know, heart disease is nutrition related, diabetes, uh, hypertension are all linked to uh, nutrition. And uh, as um, Essence has mentioned earlier that let food be thy medicine, let food be thy medicine. So it's uh, good nutrition can also prevent 95% of all disease. So it's very important that we eat healthy. And so uh, let me talk a little bit about the digestive system. So the food that we eat is uh, absorbed in our digestive system. And we all know that uh, majority of nutrient absorption occur in the small intestine. And uh, our GI is not only important in nutrient absorption, but also very important in keeping away unwanted substances or immunogens away from the body. And so our digestive system is exposed to many substances that can enter the body 
and we don't want that to happen. So our, in, our gut is uh, equipped with uh, protective factors to uh, prevent the entry of these unwanted substances into our body. So as you can see here, there's a, a lot of bacteria in our digestive system. And so our small intestine is equipped with uh, antimicrobial peptides, so right here, AMP, and uh, our antibodies, your, your immunoglobulin, as well as your uh, mucus. So this all prevent unwanted substances to enter our body. And uh, our small intestine is also equipped with uh, many immune cells to mount an immune response if any of these foreign substances enter our body. In fact, most of our immune cells is located in our digestive system. Also, our intestinal cells are uh, uh, connected tightly by what is known as your tight junction proteins. So your so unwanted substances cannot enter the small intestine or the large intestine, so it cannot enter the body. So these are some of the things that uh, protect our body from our unwanted uh, substances from the gut. So why is it very important to ma maintain a healthy gut? As I mentioned, we want to maintain uh, homeostasis. We want to keep our gut uh, healthy so unwanted substances can't go in. However, in, uh, there are cases that our gut is not healthy. So some of those causes are like you have an imbalance of uh, bad bacteria from good bacteria. And so when this, uh, the integrity of the gut is compromised, those bacteria or unwanted substances can enter our body. And that is what is known as leaky gut. And uh, leaky gut is, uh, can cause inflammation, which is linked to many of the chronic diseases, such as uh, cardiovascular disease, which I am very interested. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the gut microbiota is a current research focus in our research group. So our gut uh, contains many bacteria. In fact, we have more bacterial cells than our cells in our body. And the most dominant phyla of bacteria in our gut is the bacteroides and the firmicutes. And so uh, our bacteria population changes as uh, we, we, we get older, and it is known that our gut bacteria is stabilized when we get uh, two years old, but then it can also be altered by different uh, things in our life. So here are some right here, uh, different factors that can uh, alter our bacteria. So my main thing is our diet. But the use of antibiotics, as we all know, our medications can affect bacteria in our gut, stress, and exercise. And as you can see here on the left, uh, our digestive system is uh, occupied by different bacteria, population of different bacteria, but most of it is located in your colon because of the neutral pH, so in the stomach, there's a little bit of bacteria, but it's very acidic. And also the oxygen level affect the bacterial population. So, and, and in the small intestine, it becomes neutral. And so bacteria starting to grow right in the small intestine, but most of them is in the colon. So a lot of bacterial population is in the colon. So it is also known that bacterial population changes uh, in obese individuals. So bacterial changes, so in an obese individual, you have a high ratio of firmicutes to bacteroides compared to your uh, lean individuals. So as you can see here on the right, your lean individuals has a higher uh, abundance of uh, bacterial phyla from the bacteroides. And also in obesity, 
there's a decrease in your bifidobacteria and your lactobacillus, which we all have heard, and other bacterial uh, population is reduced in obesity. And um, so we want to maintain a good population of good bacteria in our gut. And as uh, someone had mentioned earlier, I think Essence had mentioned earlier, prebiotics are very important in gut health. Uh, so prebiotics are defined a selectively fermented ingredient that allows specific changes, both in the composition and activity of the gut bacteria and confer health benefits. So how does this prebiotics uh, confer health benefits? So what they do, this uh, prebacteria, they become fuel for our intestinal bacteria. So they are usually fermented by bacteria in our gut and produce short chain fatty acids and many metabolites. And the short chain fatty acid can be used by the body as a source of energy. So it can uh, increase self proliferation and differentiation of your intestinal cell. So the turnover of intestinal cell is affected. It can also decrease the pH of the intestinal lumen since they are acidic. And so it can inhibit the growth of uh, pathogenic bacteria. So fermentation of prebiotics also produce other metabolites uh, such as enzymes that can influence uh, the activity of, uh, of other phenolic compounds. So as you see here also, uh, not just fiber uh, is able to act as prebiotics, but your phenolic compounds, since they are they stay in our gut, can also influence uh, what's happening with the bacteria in our gut and can uh, promote health, not just of the digestive system, but also the whole body. So now let's talk about uh, weed germ. So what is weed germ? So weed germ is the embryonic part right here as you can see here of the wheat grain. So normally, wheat germ is removed during processing. When, uh, people, uh, when wheat producers want to produce flour, they usually remove wheat germ to increase the shelf life of the flour. And so when you, during this processing, you remove a lot of the nutrients uh, that is present in the germ of the wheat grain. And I think it's very similar to rice when we process the rice and just uh, remove some of the germ as well as the bran, which has a lot of nutrients uh, that only gives you the white rice right here. So that's the same thing with a uh, wheat germ. It's removed during processing to increase shelf life and um, normally just uh, used in other products, not. Uh, very much used in nutrition until recently. Oops. But as I mentioned, it is uh, high in uh, many bioactive compounds, many uh, such as your vitamin E, your polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it also contains fiber. And the amino acid tryptophan, and uh, tryptophan similar to what's found in turkey and greater than oats. So right here is a picture of your wheat germ. And so the health benefits of wheat germ is now just beginning to be realized. And so there's a small studies that's been conducted, excuse me, in animals and humans showing the antioxidant benefits of consuming uh, wheat germ. And now you can see in the market that uh, people are selling uh, wheat germ. So in our research, we're interested in looking whether a wheat germ has a, okay, whether wheat germ has a direct effect in the gut as well as systemically in, uh, in obesity and insulin resistance. So I'm gonna present with you some of our findings in our animal study. 
using uh, midterm. So the perf so this is a, the project of one of my PhD students. So he investigated the effects of wheat germ supplementation in uh, preventing gut bacterial dysbiosis or the imbalance between the bacteria in our gut and inflammation within the gut as well as systemically and uh, inflammation within the adipose tissue or our fat cells and how it affects our glucose homeostasis. So this is an animal model where we feed uh, mice high fat diet supplemented with wheat germ. So his hypothesis was that wheat germ, because it contains many bioactive components, including fiber, will uh, prevent gut dysbiosis and inflammation and promote an anti-inflammatory phenotype and uh, prevent adipose tissue inflammation and insulin res resistance in a mouse model of uh, diet-induced obesity. So for this study, we uh, used mouse that we fed high-fat diet for uh, 12 weeks, and we fed them different types of diets, so control, control containing wheat germ, and the uh, high fat diet that contain uh, wheat, with and without wheat germ. So this diet was given to the mouse for 12 weeks and we collected various uh, tissues after uh, dietary supplementation. So here are some of our findings. So we measure uh, bacterial composition and we also measure the production of short chain fatty acid in the gut and then analyze statistically right here. These are some of the statistical methods that we use. And so here are his findings. So as you can see here, there's a, a separation between uh, the bacteria of the mouse that are fed high fat and the control diet. However, there is not a uh, much difference in uh, the wheat germ oops, the wheat germ supplemented group, particularly in the control group. There's a slight separation in the high fat group, but that is not statistically significant. And as you can see here on the right, uh, this is the changes in bacterial population in the at the phylum level. So there's some differences between the high fat and the control, but there's not much significant difference uh, with wheat germ supplementation. So high fat uh, reduce actinobacteria and increase uh, deferibacters. But wheat germ doesn't have much effect in this bacterial phyla. However, looking at the family of gut bacteria, as you can see here, lactobacilli, which is a good bacteria, is significantly increased by uh, wheat germ, particularly in the high fat supplement, high fat fed mice. And so we also look at the short chain fatty acid production because I mentioned earlier that uh, prebiotics, uh, fermentation of prebiotics produce uh, short chain fatty acid. And as you can see here, short chain fatty acid is increased, but mostly in the control fed group, not in the high fat fed group. So we term increases uh, short chain fatty acid only in the control diet fed mice. So in summary, uh, his first aim that we term favored the growth of lactobacilli related bacteria, especially in the high fat fed mice but it only in, uh, influenced short chain fatty acid production in the control group. So now uh, we examine the effect of wheat germ on the gut itself, uh, uh, as well as systemic inflammation. So is there an inflammation within the gut as well as uh, in the body? So how we assess that, we look at immune cells within the gut 
And we also look at the tight junction proteins. I mentioned earlier the tight junction proteins are the one that holds your in, if, intestinal epithelial cells together. So bacteria can't go in. And we also uh, measured uh, circulating inflammatory markers in, that's present in your serum. And then here is the statistical analysis that we did. And so as uh, you can see here, so these are looking at the immune cells within the gut. So high fat diet tended to reduce your T regulatory cells. So T regulatory cells are the immune cells that uh, mellow down your immune response. So if there's an inflammatory response, your T regulatory cells are the ones that regulate the inflammatory response. But wheat germ had no significant effect on the T cells. And so we then look at the inflammatory uh, cytokines within the gut. So IL-6, interleukin-6 is a pro-inflammatory uh, protein, while, while IL-10, interleukin-10 is an anti-inflammatory protein. And as you can see here, wheat germs significantly increase the anti-inflammatory IL-10 within the gut. And then we look at the antimicrobial peptide that I talked to you about earlier. So the antimicrobial peptide uh, protects the gut from unwanted bacteria and uh, wheat germ increase the antimicrobial peptide within the gut as you can see here. So Reg3, Beta, and Gamma are antimicrobial peptides. And then, uh, so we, we look at uh, inflammation within the gut, but we also look at inflammation that's circulating in the body by measuring uh, cytokines uh, that's circulating in our blood. So as I mentioned earlier, IL-6 is IL-1 beta are all pro-inflammatory, the same as TNF-alpha, and those are reduced by wheat germ right here, as you can see. In wheat germ-fed group, all these pro-inflammatory molecules are reduced by wheat germ, whether it's added in the high fat or the control group. So definitely, wheat germ has anti-inflammatory properties. So, so far, we have shown that uh, wheat germ has no effect on short-chain fatty acid and uh, your inflammatory cells, T regulatory cells, but it selectively increased lactobacilli within the gut. And so our hypothesis that the, uh, the short-chain fatty acid uh, promotes T reg cell production and activate STAT3 to produce anti-inflammatory peptide is not supported because remember, we didn't see any changes in T regulatory cells and we didn't see an increase in butyrate in high fat diet. So what we're thinking, how can this antimicrobial peptide be increased? So another path that my student look into is the tryptophan. Remember, I mentioned earlier that uh, wheat germ contains a good amount of tryptophan. So what we're thinking is the metabolites of tryptophan uh, produced by lactobacilli can stimulate another cytokine, your IL-22, from your intestinal cells that activates the production of your antimicrobial peptide. So this is the next line of experiment that he conducted. So what he did is look at IL-22. And as you can see here, your wheat germ increased IL-22. And it also increased your antimicrobial peptide right here. And um, tight junction protein is uh, not affected by wheat germ and the phosphorylation of uh, STAT3. So STAT3 is a transcription factor that can um, regulate the activity of your regulatory cells. 
your T cells. And as you can see here, wheat germ right here increases activation of your STAT3. So the summary for aim to resolve. So there's no uh, change in lymphocyte or your immune cell population, but it promotes uh, anti-inflammatory uh, interleukin 10 and reduce pro-inflammatory production of cytokines. And so it also upregulated the production of Reg3, which is an antimicrobial peptide right here, and through the signaling from interleukin 22. So there's definitely some changes in the gut. And so what we're interested, so these changes in the gut, does it translate to changes systemically, such as uh, can it reduce uh, insulin resistance? And so what he, we did is look at inflammation within the adipose tissue, our fat, and look at uh, glucose homeostasis. And here are the statistical tests that we perform. And so as you can see from this slide right here, there is uh, all these are inflammatory markers uh, in your fat cells. So as you can see in your fat cells, your wheat germ. So high fat diet increases inflammation in your fat cells. And you don't want your, your fat cells to be inflamed because it's linked to many chronic diseases. So as you can see here, wheat germ reduce uh, inflammatory markers right here. Different inflammatory cytokines, transcription factors involved in uh, inflammation and binding protein involved in inflammation. So definitely your wheat germ can reduce inflammation within the gut. And how about uh, glucose markers? So we look at fasting glucose as you can see here on A, and indeed we germ reduce fasting glucose, and we also conducted a glucose tolerance test, and uh, indeed your we germ reduce uh, your glucose tolerance and improve your markers of insulin resistance right here. So we germ improve fasting blood glucose and insulin estimate of insulin resistance known as HOMA IR. So in, in summary of the study in our animals for his AIM-3, so we germ uh, prevented inflammation in your adipose tissue and also in, improved fasting blood glucose and insulin resistance. And the action of wheat germ is through activation of IL-22 and secretion of your antimicrobial anti peptides within the gut, which uh, can prevent inflammation in your adipose tissue. So this is our findings in our animal study. And this have been published in uh, British Journal of Nutrition and the Journal of Nutrition, if you are interested. But uh, again, that is just an animal study. So does it translate to humans? So we have conducted a human study supplementing, uh, looking at overweight individuals su supplemented with wheat germ. So this next study that I'm gonna discuss is uh, looking at the effects of wheat germ supplementation for four weeks on inflammation, metabolic, and gut health markers of overweight adults. So just like our hypothesis in our animal study, we hypothesized that wheat germ, because of its many uh, bioactive components such as fiber, will alter the gut microbiota and improve markers of inflammation and insulin resistance in overweight adults. So what we did here is uh, we recruited 40 overweight individuals. And uh, so here are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we assigned them to receive either a control or a uh, germ in their diet. So this is just uh, how 
the visit was uh, conducted. So the uh, participant came to the study site uh, four times and they were given the supplement, regium supplement uh, for four weeks or one month. And so the regium supplement is given as energy balls. And here is the nutrient composition uh, comparing the control and the wheat germ. And so here are some of the analysis that was conducted um, before and after supplementation. So we did anthropometric measurements, physical activity. We look at their stool and measure different uh, laboratory analysis. And so here is uh, the demographic information of our study participant. So we recruited 40, but one dropped out of the study. So we only ended up with 19 individuals in the control group. And here is the uh, diff uh, distribution, how many males and female in our study. So there's more male in comparison to female. And the average age is about uh, 30 years old, 25 to 30 years old. And there's no significant difference between the region group and the control group. And here is the distribution of, in terms of ethnicity. So most of our participants are Caucasian and uh, there's some Asians that also participated. So looking at the effect of uh, wheat germ, on bacterial population in overweight individuals. Unlike our um, animal study, as you can see here, there is no difference in the bacterial population in um, comparing between baseline and final before and after supplementation between the control and the wheat germ group. And as you can see here, there's also no differences in uh, bacterial phylum at baseline and after supplementation. So A right here is the control and B is a uh, wheat germ. So here is uh, looking at the short chain fatty acid. So there is no difference also in uh, short chain fatty acid in um, individuals, uh, overweight individuals that consume wheat germ compared to the control. So although there's no differences in gut bacteria population, we saw a significant decrease in uh, glycated hemoglobin, which is a marker of glucose, long-term glucose control, as well as insulin, and the marker of HOMA, uh, insulin resistance, HOMA IR is all uh, reduced by wheat germ, but not in the control group. And uh, resistin is a cytokine produced in your fat cells. It's also reduced by your wheat germ, but not in the control group. So in conclusion, uh, we, we germ supplementation in overweight individuals improve markers of insulin resistance, your glycated hemoglobin, insulin, and HOMA IR, but it's not due to changes within the gut. So there is the, the positive effect that we have observed in glucose homeostasis seem to be not related to changes happening within the gut, but can partly be attributed to decrease in resistance. So uh, in summary, both our animal and human study demonstrate that wheat germ can improve glucose homeostasis and at, at, attenuate adipose tissue inflammation. So definitely more studies are needed. Um, the exact dose, how much you need to consume and how long you need to consume is still in question. But our studies provide a rational that wheat germ can be an effective and economical option to uh, improve insulin resistance. And so uh, hopefully the, the data that I've shown you uh, demonstrate that indeed uh, the food that we eat can be the safest form of medicine. 
and uh, the slowest form of uh, poison. So the studies uh, on our human study on weed germ has not been published. So we just finished that uh, study. And so we are just uh, writing the manuscript for that. And uh, the work that I have presented would not have been possible without uh, research funding. And so our research funding comes from different sources. Our animal study uh, funding came from the Oklahoma Agricultural Experiment Station. And the human study is uh, supported by US Department of Agriculture and also funding from the my uh, endowed professorship from the College of Education and Human Sciences. And uh, the findings that I presented also is not just uh, due to one person, but uh, a lot of work from different graduate, multiple graduate and undergraduate students, as well as various collaboration within OSU and outside OSU, Oklahoma State University. And with that, I am ready for questions. Uh, we know that uh, questions are granted in life and answers errant. And uh, before I entertain questions, I would just like to share with you some uh, pictures of our campus where we're located. So we're also located in a College of Education and Human Sciences. So right here is the College of Education. And here is where I am, the human sciences. So the, our laboratory is right here on the left side right here. And here is our library, our beautiful campus. So with that, I'm ready to entertain questions. I guess it, I'm ready to entertain questions. Is that right, Essence? Thank you, Dr. Edraline. Um, we have common in terms of the way our colleges are designed, such as we're also under the College of Education. Good to know that because there are some universities where nutrition and food technology are actually in different departments. So it's good to know that we have common thing about that. But uh, for the first question, Dr. Edraline, since you've mentioned that there are still uh, so much things to be done regarding the study. Let's say, for instance, you have not yet identified as to how much uh, wheat germ should we consume, okay, to have an impact on the insulin and in terms of the weight loss. But probably you can cite some uh, application in terms of the day-to-day -day practice of nutrition in terms of weight loss or body fat loss using the your study. So... I, everyone um, always want to, so everything when I am asked about this question, so everything is in moderation, you know, so I, we're not encouraging to consume a large amount of wheat germ, but rather, so we use uh, 30 grams, that, that study that we have is 30 grams per day, and as we can see, we see improvement in markers of um, insulin resistance. So I'm thinking between 50, maybe 30 to 100 grams is, is adequate, but uh, just consuming, I'm not proponent, I'm not a proponent of just consuming wheat germ, but rather a balanced diet coupled with exercise is what is necessary. So as we all know, um, people are just kind of sometimes look at some of these studies and, oh, uh, blueberry or wheat germ is good for you, so I'll just consume a lot of them. But uh, no, uh, I'm not a proponent of that, but rather do everything in moderation and uh, a balanced diet. I agree, Dr. Edraline. It's Movaba, moderation, variety, and balance. There's <laughs> another question for Dr. Edraline. Uh -huh. uh, this one from Professor Seabug. Do you have safe brands of wheat germ that you can uh, that people can buy in the market? Is it safe to order from online stores? Uh, I don't know if the any what are the safe brands because um, are the brand the wheat germ that we donate uh, that we use for our study is only donated from uh, like a. Uh, 
a wheat milling processing company here in Oklahoma. So uh, I, th I don't know, if, like online, you just, just need to be careful online uh, what you purchase, you know? But I don't know if it's a uh, wheat germ is uh, widely available in the Philippines. So uh, I don't know if there's any better brand over the other. So I won't recommend any. Okay, thank you, Dr. Edeline. So no particular brand, but be careful on the in terms of the source, maybe. Exactly. And 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 who knows? Uh, Rice, rice, uh, rice germ might be as efficient. So just eating uh, your whole grain rice rather than white rice, you know. Uh, in the Philippines, we tend to like the whitest possible, whitest rice as possible. But uh, for me, I started eating brown rice and uh, with the wheat germ, with the with the germ and the bran. So it, it might be as good. Okay. Uh, another questions, doc. Uh, another question, Doctor uh, Adrienne. Are there considerations in terms of preparation of the wheat germ for consumption to make it bioavailable, or is it directly consumed or processed along with the food? That's from Ma Michelle of Food Tech Department. Definitely, processing will affect the bioavailability. So it, it might increase uh, uh, the bioavailability because it expo exposes like other bioactive components and uh, from wheat germ. And so in our studies, we, in our human study, we um, didn't cook the wheat germ. So we just add it as it is. But uh, I, for myself, I've been consuming wheat germ and I cook it. So uh, there's no studies in terms of bioavailability that I know of, but I think definitely it's affected by uh, processing. Another area that we could probably explore in the future to mm -hmm. affect the bioavailability. Uh, there's a question, uh, somebody's raising his hand. I think it's Sir Kenneth. Sir Kenneth, are you still there? Sir Kenneth. Jiao, if I pronounce it right, Sir Kenneth. Okay, Sir Kenneth, you can turn your microphone on for your question to Dr. Edralin. Um, so about the statement in the conclusion a while ago about uh, um, your statement said that wheat germ can be a little poison in the long run. Can you please elaborate about that statement? Mm, I don't remember uh, saying it can be a poison, but everything, uh, I guess everything that we eat in, in too much, even though it's food, can be poison in the body. Uh, maybe that's kind of what you are saying. We didn't have any study that you, if you eat too much, it can be a poison. But, but rather I'm saying that... Uh, if you eat too much of everything, it's not a good thing. So like, for example, even if you eat uh, like, let's say your mango, that's normally good. If you eat too much, it's not good for you. So that's kind of, I think what I'm emphasizing, but we didn't, we didn't uh, have a study where we look at the toxicity of too much of this um, wheat germ. But rather, what I'm saying is if you consume too much of everything in the overall like long term can lead to problems. So it has to be a balanced diet, everything in moderation. Does that answer your question, Kenneth? Yes, thank you. Another question for Dr. Edreline, this time from Sir Mar of the Nutrition Department. Given the benefits of wheat germ, how can we recommend or encourage its consumption by the Filipino population who have a different staple like what you said, Dr. Edreline, earlier that 
uh, here in the Philippines, we have this notion, the whiter the rice, the better. So uh, can you give us some recommendations on, as to how we will encourage the population to have uh, this wheat germ as part of our staple? Actually, I'm not encouraging that well, since, we, since wheat is not a major commodity in the Philippines, right? So I'm actually not a proponent of uh, promoting wheat germ in the Philippines, but rather I would promote local products like uh, like maybe consuming, promoting into the Filipinos that uh, don't make your rice as white as possible because we consume a lot of rice. And uh, we process it. We remove a lot of the nutrients by processing it. So I would I would recommend more the promotion of uh, products that's more available in the Philippines, like uh, as I said, uh, education educating the Filipinos uh, to consume uh, whole grain rice, like without making it as white as possible, and. Uh, to reduce the risk for many chronic diseases, uh, promoting consumption of fruits and vegetables, promoting uh, less processed foods, and uh, promoting exercise. So that, that those are the things that I would promote. I am uh, not promoting uh, wheat germ at all. Uh, the only reason why we study wheat germ here is because uh, Oklahoma is a major wheat producer. And also wheat germ is uh, a byproduct of wheat processing. So in terms of what to promote in the Philippines, I would rather promote um, products that's generally consumed in the Philippines as, uh, for health. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. I think that's a challenge for us nutritionists also because we really have to promote polyphenol uh, reach food sources and we really have to encourage uh, a lot of our uh, population members or our target population in terms of uh, consuming or increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. And what, like what you said, the local sources that we have here in the Philippines, which will be more cost effective on our end. Uh, Another question po from Ma'am Diane Mendoza, also from Nutrition Department. Uh, yung diet daw po ba is, uh, I have to clear this up, uh, is diet, ah, okay, is the, di is the diet the same in the, in both groups po ba? In both groups that we use, is it the same? For, for the human study, you mean? Yes, for the human study. So, Same in both groups? No, we don't control the, the other diet. The, it, we only added the wheat germ to the diet of those uh, people. So we, we don't control the other food that they eat. Ah, okay. Po. How about, yeah. how about uh, this one, uh, another question for Dr. Edreline? Since a lot of uh, people right now are into immune support, as their goal because of the, um, or this is prevention, let's say, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is the role of the gut and, and how can nutrition support this? Oh gosh, nutrition is very important in our uh, immune system. And um, so eating, a, I am a proponent. I mean, although we study functional food, uh, some people, um, would just focus on one particular food. For example, the data that I presented today is just on wheat germ. So people might just be, oh, I need to be consuming wheat germ. But rather it's a balance. It's a balance of the food that we eat, uh, getting all the nutrients from a variety of foods. So your fruits, vegetables, and you know all the vitamins and nutrients that we get from food will help our gut uh, our immune system uh, can mount an immune response with uh, this COVID. And so it's very important that we eat a lot of uh, nutrition, nutritious food. And unfortunately, I think uh, when I go to the Philippines, I, I don't know when the last time I went to the Philippines, uh, maybe 2017 or 2015, I don't remember. But um, we tend to not eat a lot of processed food. So uh, although there's a lot of local fruits and vegetables uh, and we don't consume that. And we also are so fond of uh, having the 
the exercise is not uh, promoted. We tend to not be, not wanted, not wanting to be outside, you know, to walk and uh, doing exercise and eating healthy. So uh, obesity is a major problem in the Philippines. So I would say that uh, just eating a balanced diet um, and exercising is a key in many of these chronic diseases. Thank you, Dr. Edraline. If we will summarize everything that you've mentioned, um, it's the key here is to have moderation, nothing in excess, ba balance in everything that we consume, or in e even the things that we do. Of course, yeah, exactly. variety. Exactly. And I like the slide that you have shown. Good nutrition can prevent 95% of disease. So make sure to practice good nutrition all the time. So thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Edraline. And, thank you. And uh, now we will be awarding the uh, certificate to Dr. Edraline. So the uh, certificate reads, uh, this certificate of appreciation is given to Dr. Edraline Aguinaldo Lucas of Oklahoma State University for sharing your time, your knowledge, and expertise as speaker during the second Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture Series entitled Gut Fiber, a webinar on fiber as a functional food component to improve gut health. Held online via USD Zoom and YouTube channel of the USC College of Education, given this 26th day of June in the year of our Lord 2021, signed by Ma'am Essence Jean Del Castillo and yours truly, Ma'am Kathleen Cresada, and of course by Dean Associate Professor Pilar I. Romero and Regent Father Maximo P. Gatella. Thank you so much, Dr. Edraline Lucas. And another Dr. Edraline. We have another certificate of gratitude is given to you because you generously donated your honorarium for this um for this uh webinar for our isang daan isang daan solidarity Tari project in support of the College of Education scholars also given this day also signed by our Dean Associate Professor Pilar Romero and our Regent Father Maximo P. Gatella OP. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Edralin Lucas. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, to see all of you. And I think I'm gonna stay for a little bit um, until I guess I think I get, until I get sleepy. <laughs> May we invite po Dean Romero and Father Gatella to kindly turn on their cameras po. If possible. Hi, and Dr. Edralin. I think, Ma'am Essen, it's difficult to get uh, the picture. Uh, so maybe we could uh, have a picture taking first with the uh, members i mean for those who of course who are here on zoom because those on youtube of course we cannot have picture taking with you with you guys but those on zoom may we request to have your camera open just for the picture taking with dr edraline and dr azar since uh doctor it's quite late in doc uh in oklahoma so Dr. Edraline might stay a little longer, but may we request everyone to turn on your camera so that we will have a picture taking with Dr. Edraline and Dr. Azar. Mom Essen is uh, or Mom is it Mom Joanna who will be taking the picture or Sir Mar? Is and it okay? I can and Mom Flory me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So again, may we request everyone to just turn on for a while your camera so we can have a group picture with Dr. Edraline and Dr. Azar. So Ma'am Flor, you may give the cue if you're going to take our photo. Okay, over. let's have the first panel. Po. So one, two, three, smile. <laughs> All right. For the second panel, one, two, three, smile. Keep smiling lang po. If last smiles, one. We don't know which one yeah. we belong. <laughs> so last one, one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you very much, Pop. 
Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Edraline, for being so generous for your time and also for supporting our Isang Daan, Isang Daan Solidar uh, Solidarity Project. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and now, uh, before we have our second speaker, we would like, of course, to acknowledge our YouTube viewers. So we have attendees from from Tarlac Agricultural University, and all the way from Davao del Norte State College. Okay, We also have members from uh, Nutritionist Dietitians Association of the Philippines and also from Council of Deans and Heads of Nutrition and Dietetics. And now, to introduce our second speaker, may I call on the faculty member from the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, Ma'am Eileen May Del Rio. Good morning. Our second speaker this morning obtained his bachelor's degree in food sciences from the University of Nottingham, England, and his PhD in food sciences from the same university. He held several administrative posts as the program chair for food technology program, deputy dean of academic and student development, and deputy dean of research and postgraduate studies. He also served as the Dean of University of Science Malaysia for five years. He has been active in helping government agencies with up-to-date knowledge of food science and continuing education. He was part of the Malaysian Ministry of Health Committee for Functional Food and Penang Government Committee for Food Science and Technology Awareness Program and promoting the understanding of integrated quality system development of ASEAN agro-based food industries. He had also been appointed as the governing board member of an international certification body dealing with quality management system certification. Our speaker is actively involved in public service. Since 1997, he has been the consultant to various consultancy projects with food and nutrition companies dealing with food supplements, functional foods, and beverages. His achievements in research have been featured in various publications and in media. He authored and co-authored 16 researches and 106 publications a renowned international speaker on various topics, including nutrition and functional food science, research needs of small and medium enterprise of ASEAN, halal practice, and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome the Nutra strategists, Dr. Azar Matt Ayasa. Hello, guys. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Azar. Thank you. Just going to share my slide now. Now I'm going to assume everybody can see the slide. Yes, Dr. Azar. All right. So again, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, Ms. Asen has been in communication since, I don't know, 2019, 2020, but we had to, um, <laughs> we had to kind of uh, postpone it to today. So finally it is happening. Okay, guys, um, this is my topics, uh, making noodles functional. I've been uh, studying noodles a lot, but not from the perspective of um, nutrition or biochemistry, but from the perspective of food technologies, especially from the uh, for, um, new product development area. So I'm very happy to share with all those, with all you guys, the beautiful Philippines uh, that are very proper in the way you do things. If you come to Malaysia, you'll be surprised. We are not as proper. 
<laughs> we kind of uh, kind of messy a little bit right now. Okay, so this is my university, University of Science Malaysia. We are located um, on an island about two hours away from Thailand. So we are like um, the northern side of Peninsula Malaysia. <clears throat> Okay, we are from a food tech program. We are currently um, approved program by the Institute of Food Technology, uh, IFT, uh, Chicago, USA, until 2025. So today we talk about noodles and how to make noodles functional. There are five ways how to make food functional. Number one, we simply increase whatever bioactive compounds already there. We just find a way how to make it more available. Number two, uh, if the bioactive compounds are not there, we can simply add, uh, like, like in the case of the noodles today, we add dietary fibers, yeah? But, but these fibers or bioactive compounds must be proven to have beneficial effects on health. Number three, we can replace a component that is normally uh, cause negative effects, uh, fats, for instance, or salt. Um, I'm going to show an example of noodle as well that we did. Uh, we can remove fats from, uh, instead of using um, um, oil frying, we replace it with air drying. Instead of using uh, normal sodium chloride, we use salt substitute. Number four, we can eliminate a um, component that is known to cause harmful effect like allergenic proteins. Uh, we did not do any of that. And number five, we, we attempted to do um, high tech uh, methods, which is by using uh, control release technology, we can increase bioavailability of uh, bioactive compounds. But it's, it is not simply just adding and replacing. You must also adjust the process and the formulation. And that is should be the way how the food technology in the area of functional food science should work. We don't just uh, add something and we forget about it. That is not proper we have to adjust the process, we have to adjust the formulation, maybe some kind of uh, um, hydrocolloids are needed, etc. So in my field of work, I've been studying um, noodles for uh, I think 10 years now, but I've been working in the university for 25 years. Um, the, the method is quite crazy, we don't really um, the approach is different from ordinary uh, scientific approach. Normally people would uh, read literature reviews or they would read um, um, review papers. But for me, I would prefer to come up with ideas just to solve a problem or to create something new. And some of you might think crazy. And from there, we work backwards and try to put science into the ideas. I'm not sure about Philippines, but uh, in Malaysia, we have this, um, this product called Dor Dol. It is basically um, confectionery that you, um, that you undergo um, a very long, high temperatures or thermal treatments, like six to nine hours of heating and heating. At the end, we produce uh, confectionery, yeah? So we freeze dried it and that is considered crazy. <laughs> People think that's ridiculous, but that's what we do. And uh, some time ago, 2014, we produce uh, layered noodles. I will, I will talk about this later a little bit. Where if you can see in the middle of the layered noodles, there is that... Send a phone book, I know. Layered. Uh, <laughs> There is layer of that um, capsaicin uh, chili powder, yeah? And that was meant to reduce the feeling of pain when people eat these noodles. We'll talk about this later, but first, now I want you to guess what is the problem with this guy? How about this guy? This, 
lady. And this guy, can you guess his problem? <laughs> okay. Problem is lacking of fibers. Those guys and the lady having some sort of constipation. WHO recommendation is 25 to 40 grams of dietary fibers per day. Um, well, this is kind of old data, maybe the United States, um, they say having only each person consume only 12 to 15 gram a day. I'm not sure whether that's correct. Maybe uh, <laughs> Dr. Adrenaline can verify. That's correct. <laughs> Anyway, the Maasai people of Kenya, they consume a lot, it's like 50 gram of fiber a day. So you can imagine the difference, dif differences in their digestive system and differences in their, the health of these very different people from different regions of the world. All because we are so modern, we are moving away with dietary fibers. I'm sure the Philippines are like Malaysia, like Thailand. We are moving towards a uh, lifestyle of the United States. We are eating less and less dietary fibers. We have we are having more and more meat, more of the thing that we can keep in the fridge. But those guys in the in the Kenya, in the Maasai region, they are still eating very high dietary fibers. So you can anticipate all kind of health problems in the modern people like us. <clears throat> so um, I think uh, Dr. Adralin talked a lot, uh, summarized a lot of things about fiber, which is good. Uh, the concept is very simple. Uh, if the digestive system is normal, there is no problem. You have no diseases. If you consume high fiber, containing soluble and insoluble products, fiber, with sufficient amount of water. Uh, this especially soluble fiber, it will form some kind of gel in the digestive system. Uh, together with insoluble fiber, uh, you will form a very nice uh, sausage shape, uh, feces, yeah, uh, or stools. Uh, this is a good shape and it will help to eliminate a lot of toxin, maybe some cholesterol. Uh, this, uh, the promotion of regularity is very important for health. So because we are modern, we are becoming uh, more sophisticated. We keep a lot of stuff in the fridge. We are eating less of dietary fibers. So there are two types of important fibers here. One is soluble and insoluble. Thank you very much, Dr. Adrelin for uh, taking time today, she mentioned about the soluble fiber, especially being fermented somewhere there, uh, the cecum area, producing short chain fatty acids that can be used as fuel and also important for the health of the intestinal lining. Okay, but what I am more interested is in the, the insoluble fiber, the one that is not fermented. Yeah, so what does it mean is that um, the soluble fiber, once it reaches the, uh, the active area of the uh, colon, it will get uh, fermented, it will produce short chain fatty acids, and it will liberate back the, the water. So the water is being released back into the colon. But for the insoluble, uh, unfermented, uh, the water remains there and become a part a part of the feces become, make the feces bulkier and easier for it, uh, taking less time for the feces to stay in the colon. So one of the mechanism for cholesterol reduction is by, by using this uh, bile acids, uh, which is used for fat emulsification and some of these uh, reabsorb. So the theory is, is if we excrete a lot of uh, stools and uh, transit time is uh, is not very long so we can excrete a lot of cholesterol okay so we are interested more in the insoluble dietary fibers so again what give this uh, dietary fibers is uh, physiological attributes um, 
the physical characteristic that we are interested is in is the molecular design and the solubility of course so for for the soluble it go into the stomach and other parts of the digestive system it help with gastric retention um, slow down the rate of emptying as mentioned there is fermentation and what we are more interested in the insoluble dietary fibers which is on uh, feces becoming more bulky and therefore it will help to release uh, the feces more easily yeah so <clears throat> the molecular design of dietary fibers you can uh, divide into three um, different fiber molecules they have different levels of bacterial degradation. Um, short chain fatty acid can be oxidized. Uh, um, they can produce ATP. Along the way, there is a hydrogen production, CO2 production, CH4 production, and and uh, some the sugar residues with free polar groups. This can form um, hydrogen bonds with adjacent molecules. So the soluble one will, will help to hold water, hydration, but, but this water will be liberated and absorbed back in the colon. So we are more into the insoluble because one is hold on to water, it will be uh, excreted together with the feces. So it helps with the promoting regularity. Okay, and of course the gel matrix in the intestine. This has been shown, uh, especially in the in the case of beta glucan uh, soluble fibers. It increases viscosity and a slow rate of nutrient absorption, which is which is good for sugar control. In the case of people with uh, with a diabet diabetes, yeah. So you can compare between soluble and insoluble fibers. Soluble can, can include uh, pectin, beta glucan, some gums, algal polysaccharides. Uh, this has tendency to swell in water. They form gel or glue-like gels. Uh, you, you can play it on your hand. It, this gel is like, like a glue and, and you, you can play with it. It's, it's just like ordinary glue or gels. They become viscous. They can also soften the stools and slow the rate of stomach emptying. But again, because they are being fermented, um, the structure will be broken down and therefore the water will be released in the colon and reabsorbed. But uh, the soluble fibers are good in terms of um, uh, they can slow down starch digestion and help. With slowing down the glucose intake, therefore lowering the amount of insulin needed to process blood glucose. So it is good for people with diabetics. And in some cases, uh, some studies have shown they can bind to carcinogen or toxins. They can bind to bile salt in intestine. They can help to reduce cholesterol resorption. But again, as, as compared to insoluble, insoluble should be better in terms of uh, excretion of cholesterol. Example is cellulose and lignin, they can swell in water, increase tool weight, uh, making the feces more bulky and increase the frequency. Yeah. So insoluble is easier because it helps prevent constipation. It's easy if you want to incorporate into food products. It is, it is not as hard to, because the claim is going to be difficult for, for soluble fiber. In soluble fiber, people just understand it is good for regularity, um, constipation, um, well, maybe colonic inflammation is some kind of uh, study, but people have done study <clears throat> to show that um, insoluble fibers are also <clears throat> good for um, helping prevention of inflammation. <clears throat> okay, um, we talk about this, cellulose is not digested, lignin is not degraded, and most of these, if you can see the, um, the bolded words, all about stool, stool weight, uh, softening stool, <laughs> speeding up the movement of stool, uh, soften stool, so it is about people who really, really 
uh, have been eating too much meat and insufficient amount of uh, dietary fibers because of the modern lifestyles. Okay, but uh, when you want to design uh, anything functional food, you cannot just jump into it and ignoring the, the earth, yeah? And in the University of Science Malaysia, we follow this SDG, I'm sure UST also follow SDG. We have to do something about the earth, uh, the sustainability aspects. So before we jump into making it a functional noodle, uh, yes, with fiber, we have to consider uh, maybe uh, no hunger as SDG number two. SDG number three, uh, you have to consider good health. Uh, this functional food must must contribute to good health and, and maybe responsible consumption. So considering all these three, then only we can talk about um, designing and developing products with uh, um, functional ingredient inside yeah so that's what we did um, we uh, I I think easily like 15 years ago I was thinking there must be something that a product that I can focus on so after thinking and thinking a lot so I thought uh, noodle should be the product of choice to to focus on because number one I hate noodles Number two, noodles has a sustainability issue, a lot of oil being used. If you eat instant noodle today or this week, uh, those instant noodles, uh, most of them are being fried. Uh, there's a lot of used oil being, I mean, they must, they must have some kind of uh, uh, waste management, of course, but this oil are being used and, and they can be bad for the environment. Some preservatives are used, the coloring, the salts, the alkaline salt, the empty calories from wheat. So that, uh, that give us this uh, sustainability issue that must be addressed. And of course, uh, in Malaysia, I'm sure in Philippines, people eat a lot of noodles. If you are Chinese in Malaysia, sometimes they eat uh, noodles for breakfast, noodles for lunch, noodles for dinner. So if we can do something about noodles, if we can redesign noodles, we can reduce the problem of sustainability. That was the intention. <clears throat> so if you eat um, um, instant noodles, most of instant noodles are, are produced by frying. So the oil used, and oil is bad for the environment. Oil can be oxidized and oil contribute to calories and use oil have to be treated in certain ways. And this oil must, uh, this noodle must have some kind of um, salt uh, preservative, especially in the, in the sauce, in the seasoning, alkaline salt being used, coloring being used. So these are bad for the environment. So we wanted to solve this issue. <clears throat> so, um, the approach was to produce uh, what we call sustainability-led innovative me. Me is, I don't know, it's, it's like uh, Chinese, but also Malay. But I don't know what you call noodles in Philippines. What do you call noodles in the Philippines? I do not know. But in Malaysia, me is noodles. So... Slim, sustainability-led, innovative me. So we partially, um, partially replaced 10% of the wheat flour with 10% of uh, dietary fibers. In this case, mixture of cellulose and hemicellulose. So that one serving of that, uh, about 60 gram of uh, one serving of the slim me noodles can give 25% of approximately 25% of daily dietary fiber need. And that will promote regularity and other dietary fiber related benefits. And that is a commercial requirement. Otherwise, no industry will take up the idea and promote it because that is like ordinary noodles. At the same time, because we do not use oil for frying, we can reduce a lot on in, in, in the terms of calorie. The calorie is being reduced because we do not use oil for frying. 
we replace the oil with uh, air for air drying and and uh, 10 percent dietary fibers uh, further reduce the calorie content and it is a food science uh, it is a functional food science you cannot just add dietary fibers that's it you have to do something with the food science there must be improvement in terms of uh, processing uh, by increasing the, the length of time for steaming treatment by adding certain hydrocolloids, you can improve cooking and eating qualities. If you can try, otherwise, um, air dry noodles are very tough when it comes to cooking. It will, it will take a long time, much longer time to cook compared to uh, ordinary oil fried noodles. So when, when, when people takes like uh, eight minutes or 10 minutes to cook these noodles, air dried noodles, it is uh, not as friendly to the environment because imagine if, if there are like 60 households, 60 million households in the whole Philippines takes like 10 minutes to cook noodles, how much gas being used to cook just noodles. So we need to reduce the cooking time that is important for sustainability, okay? So again, almost zero fat because uh, no oil was used. So we have no potential of oxidized oil. We have no calorie from fat and we do not use alkaline salt and no preservative for coloring. So that is a concept of SLIMI, sustainability led innovative me, which is a functional uh, noodle. We follow the Malaysian standard this is 2009, yeah, 2009, like um, uh, 14 years ago. So alternative pro health noodles, which is not a gel. It is still a noodle. It is still made from mostly wheat flour, but we do not have any salt, alkaline salt, no oil, no color preservative. And we make sure it conform to the Malaysian standard for dried wheat noodle specifications. Okay, because of that, uh, it, it, it is possible to, to um, export this product to China or any other countries. So you compare this um, noodle, Slimi, uh, 60 gram per serving with 70 gram per serving of another brand A, you will see the brand A has much higher calorie and because of the 11 gram fat per serving and they don't have enough dietary fiber as well. So, um, so that's how the product is winning every time when you want to compare it with um, commercial product in the market. So this one, another product, I think from uh, Indonesia or something, uh, they have more per serving, uh, uh, but it has 14 gram, therefore the calorie is so much high and no fiber. Uh, another product we can compare is brand C. This is ordinary instant noodle. Uh, now we compare 60 gram versus 60 gram. Uh, again, because the, they use uh, um, fat for frying, they have 275 calorie and very low dietary fiber. So <clears throat> uh, because of that um, aspect, we consider the slim me is uh, a, a functional products that addresses sustainability, a commercial interest. So some cartoonists uh, in Malaysia, they come out with, uh, and one day I, I opened a newspaper, this is 19, uh, 2009, and people are so <laughs> into it. Um, if you don't understand Malay, me kuning is uh, yellow noodles. Untuk kurus is for slimming. See, the word slimming, um, people believe uh, slim me is for slimming, which is wrong. Uh, but uh, this is a newspaper. They they are the one who did that. I did not. I did not tell them to do that. So this this uh, husband came back. Uh, honey, I brought some. I bought something to help you slim down. And the wife was so excited. She evidently she's quite fat. There. Uh, she thought it was some kind of bicycle or something. Tara, it's not bicycle. It's a noodle. Hmm. So they were actually talking about the slimy product. Yeah. <clears throat> And sometime after that, 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 
you see a lot of slimming in the, in the market in Malaysia, of course. If you go to Lazada, I'm not sure about Philippines, maybe only in Malaysia, or Shopee, you, know, you can purchase online. So it became, um, it became a commercial products. All right, so unfortunately, people, um, 2015, uh, our competitors from India, <laughs> We did not publish this result, but our friends in, in India, they, they did the same research uh, a bit late 2015. And they published most of the technology or, or uh, processes needed to, to make air dried noodles. Yeah? So basically, like, like we did, they also did the same thing. Uh, increased uh, steaming time. Um, if ordinary, um, uh, if it is uh, oil, fried noodles, you only need about two or three minutes of steaming, but for, for air dried noodles, you need up to between eight to 10 minutes of steaming that will help a lot in terms of cooking time. Yeah, so this uh, optimum cooking time will be reduced tremendously. And of course, there are one or two uh, hydrocolloids being added, which I cannot remember in this paper. So 2016, um, more and more new products being uh, introduced with the uh, air, air dried concepts. In this case, you see uh, Chintan, which is one of major players of, of, of instant noodle. They started to produce non-fried noodles, uh, low fat, of course. So the concepts are being uh, copied. And now uh, there are gonna be more and more uh, noodles that are uh, processed without oil. So most of them are Air dried. Okay, <clears throat> so 2015 done, 2016, many more products in the market, which is air dried with the steaming and certain hydrocolloids. <clears throat> so to by 2019, the licensing company who, who bought who purchased our products no longer continue with the licensing. So but 2000, uh, 2020 last year, uh, another company bought uh, I mean, uh, purchase their products, and uh, you can find this in the in the in the in the website uh, by the, a company of OCOC. They produce turmeric flat ramen. Yeah, so this is being sold in the in the internet and in the website online. <clears throat> if you Google Slim Me, they are being also still being sold to um, uh, maybe international market because that's that's what the uh, the licensing fee uh, does not cover. Okay, so anyway, um, sustainability-led innovative me is now single again, not me, the me, the noodles. Um, so if there is any uh, organization, a company, um, noodles manufacturer interested, they can just uh, contact us. Uh, we can find a way how to commercialize it. Uh, I don't know, Philippines or anywhere else in the world. It is possible to relaunch into a new products. Okay, there are five ways to make uh, food functional. In the case of uh, Slim Me, uh, adding a component, in this case, dietary fibers uh, that is not normally present, uh, that has been shown to have beneficial effects. So, so, so we did that for Slim Me, but we also replace the component, which is fat, oil for frying, we replace that with uh, oil, uh, oil replaced with the uh, air. We use, instead of using oil frying, we use air frying, air, air drying. Therefore, we manage to reduce calories a lot. Yeah. So again, when you want to change the system, you must adjust the process and the formulation. Otherwise, the product will not perform as it should. That is bad products. Okay. So, there's not many Indians in the Philippines, I am sure. But in Malaysia, we have a lots of Indian. Indians like to eat this, uh, some kind of uh, salty, uh, some kind of snack, like uh, crackers, papadum they call it. It's very high in salt. If you have five of these pieces of papadum, you have like 1.3 gram of salt. That's a lot of salt. And maximum salt, that you are supposed to consume a day is only five gram. That is a lot already. So that means you cannot eat more than uh, 20 pieces of this papadom. So 
uh, Malaysian average of salt consumption is actually 7.9 gram. 7.9 gram of salt per day. And we are supposed to consume only 5 gram of salt a day. I'm not sure about Philippines, but this is Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia um, consumption of salt. We like something salty. So we thought one of the reasons uh, for salt consumption is the salt from noodles. There, I come again. Uh, what we do, instead of using yellow alkaline noodle, uh, now we shifted to white salted noodle. Like the name white salted noodles, the salt is there. It's very important function um, uh, in this noodle. This, we published a paper, if you're interested, uh, last year, 2020. So we use selected hydrocolloids and salt substitute uh, to play around with the white salted noodle. So instead of using white, instead of white salted noodle, now it become white salt substitute noodles. But we, we can declare it as a zero sodium chloride. Okay. Um, what is the concept? Um, all right. The main issue is this is the problem with salt. We need salt. We need salt for cooking. The higher the salt at certain level, it will help with cooking, shorter the cooking time. If the salt is too much, well, the noodle will suffer. It will not be, it will cook very, very fast, but it will become kind of soggy. Yeah. But if without salt, you need to cook longer. So we still need salt for cooking. And the problem is we need to balance the uh, salt for cooking and salt for health. You know that uh, high salt can cause uh, high blood pressure and not very friendly to those with already high blood pressure, people with uh, kidney issues, etc. <clears throat> so how we solve the problems, we incorporate hydrocolloids and then we, we replace sodium chloride in white salted noodles with salt substitute. That's a big study there. Uh, um, these are the, the problem statement. In, when it comes to sustainability, um, short cooking time or short optimum cooking time is what we are aiming for. There is no point to have a low salt or no salt noodle, but consumers have to cook it for a long time. So. Yeah, we can use uh, hydrocolloid um, to improve the yield and improve the hardness, but uh, it will not help with the optimum cooking time. So we have to find a way how to use salt substitute. Yeah, these are the four candidates of salt substitute that we use. Um, no salt, salt substitute, molten, uh, salt for life, and new salt. <clears throat> so we play with all these salts in combination with the hydrocolloids. Uh, without going into details, uh, five ways to make food functional. Number three, we replace a component, um, uh, which is the salt, uh, uh, because we know that excessive salt causes um, negative effect. So we remove sodium chloride, replace with salt substitute. Yeah, that's the approach to make it uh, functional. So cut the story short, we don't have much time. <laughs> So all the final results, uh, the control uh, on the red, original cooking time about eight minutes. Um, typical sodium chloride is one point five percent, and after ha having having done a lot of testing, several formulation, this is what we thought was the best: um, zero salt noodle ZSN plus SS two salt substitute number two plus locust bean gum. Uh, and B, ZSN plus SS4 plus locust bean gum. So we have this uh, similar quality um, with a much higher cost, of course. So this noodle um, double the, the cost of the ordinary um, with the 1.5% sodium chloride is cheap, uh, but the problem is going to be health. So this, this product, uh, functional white salt substitute noodles, uh, may be useful for people with certain health problems that should be served in hospitals. Yeah, so instead of um, serving 
patient in hospitals, uh, ordinary uh, noodles with sodium chloride. Now we have alternative. Yeah. Uh, so again, it is a, a combination of uh, SS2 or SS4. This this um, so substitute reduce cooking time, enhance saltiness, and um, uh, LBG locus bean gum help to uh, enhance the network. Okay. So these are all um, still under development. Another crazy idea uh, from us is that um, we thought uh, people like us, Philippines, uh, Malaysian, uh, mostly Southeast Asian, we love chili. We love something hot. We enjoy the pain, right? <laughs> when you eat something hot, you enjoy the pain. But uh, unfortunately, People in other parts of the world, like uh, Europe, or maybe even United States, most people there do not like um, chilies or, or capsaicin. So uh, even though capsaicin is actually a bioactive compound, uh, but they are not well received because of the pain it, it gives to these people who cannot handle it. So we thought um, we have to do something to the, uh, if you want to deliver capsaicin, uh, we have to do something with the delivery. Uh, we have to control the release of capsaicin. That's uh, methods number five. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is all paper, 2014. Um, we prepared and evaluated chili powder and rich layered noodles. So that noodles there in the middle, you can see the capsaicin layer uh, in the middle. So we hope uh, this this layer being sandwiched uh, between uh, two gastro-resistant uh, noodles layer so that when you chew this, this uh, noodles, it, the, the capsaicin will not be released so much in the mouth, but mostly should be released in the stomach. Okay. 2014, unfortunately, uh, um, the problem with this product is that um, because of that layer and layer and layer, which is unfortunately different rate of heat penetration, um, we cannot, we still cannot solve the, the problems of cooking. Uh, that, that after air drying, it become too tough. Uh, the, the sensory evaluation find out that this product will not be accepted by people, even though the idea is good. So we are still thinking of how to solve the problem. If it is solved, then we can go further with the clinical studies maybe. <clears throat> so five ways to make food functional. Um, number five is about increasing bioavailability and control release. So another idea is um, in the aspects of chewing, um, ordinary yellow alkaline noodles like we've seen here. So we ask the question, is it really necessary to add salts into noodles? Yes, we need salt for network formation of the, of the gluten. But how much salt is released during chewing to give saltiness sensation in the mouth? And how much is needed to cause saltiness sensation? Are we putting too much salt uh, that um, we swallow a, a lot of salt that do not function as a salt? I mean, uh, they're still in the noodle, not being released in the mouth, but we swallow them. We swallow the salt that do not function uh, to perform a saltiness function. So, this question um, make us to do another research to, to design another noodles uh, that is um, with this, um, what you call this, salt coated surface. <clears throat> this is the noodles under scanning electron microscope. Uh, the body is zero in salt. In the middle there, there is no salt, zero, but on the surface, we managed to do coating. Okay, the coating is, uh, there are two types of coating. Coating number one is called hyalon starch. Coating number two is called CMC, carboxymethylcellulose coating. 
and it has the salt level from 0 to 30 percent, CMC also 0 to 30 percent, and the black line there is the commercial yellow alkali noodles. So <clears throat> if you go from zero chewing to 20 chewing in the mouth, you can see the release, the release of the salt in the mouth. You know, as, as more salt is being used, definitely there, there is more, there was more release of salt in the mouth. And, and as more chewing, definitely there is more release of salt in the mouth. And we, did, we didn't measure salt, we measured the conductivity. Actually, we measured, measured salt, but we didn't report it. <clears throat> so uh, the more chewing, the more salt is released in the mouth. And it, it, is, it did not depend on the types of coating. Both coating are similar. Okay, so let's call this quick salt release in the mouth. So with this technology, we can apply less salt in the noodles but it will achieve similar salt function because the salt is released quickly in the mouth you can feel you can feel the the saltiness quickly and you do not need a lot of salt in the noodles so because of that less salt is swallowed after completing its flavoring functions so we save a lot in terms of salt application <clears throat> So the summary is that we, we use two types of coating, Hylon 7 coating, which is a type of resi resistant starch, and sample fresh coating, which is a commercial uh, CMC. This uh, sample fresh coating is the coating used for apple, I think, uh, for certain fruits. Uh, so the coating of fruits uh, now being uh, tested for uh, for noodles uh, and, and, uh, and we immerse uh, this noodle inside the solution containing the <clears throat> sample fresh coating and hyaluron 7 coating with a different level of sodium chloride. <clears throat> so the main finding is that the structural breakdown parameters like chewing, salt release properties, taste and saltiness perception of a uh, hyaluron coating 30% sodium chloride and sample fresh coating 30% sodium chloride were close to yellow alkali noodles, even though the final salt content was less than 50% of yellow alkali noodles. So you do not need um, a typical amount of salt incorporated into noodles. You need half, less than half, and you can achieve similar properties, including the saltiness perception. So suggesting that uh, this kind of practice of concentrating salt on the surface of noodles can enhance the release of salt during chewing as the structure was broken down and improve saltiness perception. So <clears throat> this is still work under progress, but we managed to publish <coughs> last year food chemistry <clears throat> use of salt coating to improve uh, mechanical, textural, cooking, and sensory properties. Air dry yellow alkaline noodles. So if you are interested, you can always find this uh, paper in the food chemistry. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think um, from our first um, ways to make um, food functional, uh, my, my topic is making noodle functional. So after having gone through, now we realize that uh, what I've done is actually there are more and more, more work on noodles. Um, I think I have like 30 publications on noodles alone. Um, three ways to make noodle functional and one of them adding component and then replace a component. And we use try, try to use high technology with the coating and uh, playing with the control release properties. Um, but when you change the system, you must adjust the process and formulation. And this is how functional food science is supposed to work. And after the year 2000, we must also address the SDG, Sustainability Development Goals, and consider sustainability as well. So every time, it's all about sustainability. Okay, that's all from me today. Thank you very much for your cooperation to listen. 
uh, half of these students of mine uh, already graduated. Uh, half of them work on noodles. Uh, some work on something else. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Miss Asen. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Azar. Thank you, Dr. Azar. Uh, uh, before we ask you questions, we would like also to acknowledge uh, our viewers on YouTube from Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Aklan State University, Bicol University, Ateneo de Zamboanga, and of course, from different uh, faculty and colleges also in USD, from College of Science, and from Faculty of Pharmacy. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Azar, so, uh, the first question uh, would be from me, of course. So, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, community kitchen or community pantry here in the Philippines. So, uh, based on your... Uh, on making noodles as a functional food, I believe that noodles can be also a staple that would be ideal for the community kitchen. So uh, my question is, which type of noodle would be cost-effective but at the same time would still be nutritious and of course safe for mass consumption since this community kitchen was actually designed to uh, this pandemic particularly to provide uh, food or even ingredients or um, grocery items actually for community with problem in terms of economic reason because of the pandemic. So which type of noodle would be for you is cost effective but at the same time nutritious and still safe for consumption of course. Okay, uh, I'm not sure exactly. But the one that we do not have to import, um, those that made not from wheat, uh, I'm talking about rice noodles. So rice noodles are supposed to be our main, our main uh, research area. A, because um, it is, you can obtain the rice flour locally. Um, and then uh, it is not made from wheat. Therefore, you save a lot in terms of uh, <clears throat> people with gluten issue <clears throat> and the process is very simple um, you just mix uh, the dough and then <clears throat> you extrude it into boiling water and it becomes uh, it's become a noodles if you want to um, dry it it is possible but there will be always be some kind of process to make it easy to cook okay so I would say we should focus uh, our work in this region on rice noodles. Okay, Kathleen. Thank you, Dr. Edraline. Another question, Dr. Edraline, since you've mentioned that you've done uh, substituting salt in some of your noodle products because of the health reasons or other reasons, will it make the noodles a uh, shelf life and shorter or will it have an impact in terms of the quality in texture? Brilliant question. Uh, <laughs> I, I I couldn't I couldn't um, share the 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 result. There's so many results. <laughs> yes, we 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 tested the shelf life as well. Once we uh, identified the formulation that we think uh, can match the conventional 1.5 percent sodium chloride, then we tested the shelf life, and we figured out the test the shelf life was was good was as, as good as the uh, ordinary uh, sodium chloride noodles. So we have no issue with the, with the chef life. Okay. okay. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Edraline, uh, Dr. Azar. Uh, this one uh, from Miss Michelle. Uh, good to know functional noodles such as the slim has been out in the market for quite some time. How comparable is the cost of producing slim versus regular noodles and considering the change of process and the replacement of ingredients? Okay, um, the only slight change in the cost of the ingredients and, and the product is special. Um, it is not ordinary, not a conventional noodle. Therefore, um, slight, slight increase in costs are normally acceptable by the consumers. And, and if you happen to go to Penang, Kathleen. <laughs> yes, I did. And, and um, you know, 
there are many hospitals in in Penang, especially the private hospital, actually, actually serve this uh, slim knee to their patients uh, because they like uh, the the idea that uh, low salt and not using salt, not using oil um, for their patients. So, by when when people have diseases problem with disease or they want to reduce calorie intake. And especially when they're on diet, uh, this kind of product become an alternative. It is not meant to feed uh, those, uh, the, the poor, the hunger, the masses, but it is meant for specialized market, people with special needs of health and people who are really, really uh, conscious on calorie consumption, Kathleen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Azar. Uh, another question, Dr. Azar, from Eunice de Jesus uh, from Food Technology. What is the initial moisture content of fresh cooked or processed noodles? Moisture content of fresh cook? You mean after cooking? Fresh cooked or processed noodles, Dr. Azar. So maybe after cooking, probably. Okay, um, <clears throat> we have to understand the question here. Uh, maybe we, we already purchased the products and we bring it home and then we cook the product at home. Yes? And then we want to know whether how much is the moisture content of that. Okay, uh, the, I think it, we, have yes. not, we have not measured exactly, but it should be similar to any other noodles. They're going to be similar water uh, absorption, uh, like any other noodles. As long as the, the process was there, there was proper steaming time during the processing, proper hydrochloric use, therefore the absorption of water should not be an issue. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Azar. Another question from Jean Gilbert Go. How, uh, how the different procedures such as air frying, substitution of salt, etc., affected the organoleptic properties of the noodles? Also, in terms of energy consumption, does air frying, when mass-produced, would consume more energy than flash frying in oil? Okay. Um... Manufacturing side, they have done this study and I do not have the data in terms of energy consumption, but it seems um, even though there is um, uh, a lot of electricity being used uh, for, for air drying and during steaming, a lot of electricity as well, but because of the mass production, uh, it is somehow uh, able to balance back the cost uh, it will not be um, a major um, major thing that will uh, not promoting the technology. This is why um, if you see the current companies are producing the air dry noodles, they are okay with it. Yeah, I think uh, that um, it balanced back with the oil frying that also reduced a lot of gas. Uh, to, to, to heat up the oil, I think there's a lot more issue when using the gas to heat up the oil for frying rather than using electricity to air dry the noodles and uh, steaming the noodles, the process of the noodles. Okay, that's actually second question. That's no big issue, either, but I do not have data for energy. How about the first question? I can't remember. Uh, the first question is, how the different procedures, such as air frying, uh, substitution of salt, etc., affected the organoleptic ah, properties of the organoleptic. Noodles. So we, we tested everything. Um, for for air drying, as again, as long as you, if you do not do steaming, if the product was uh, after air drying, that's it. You know, there, during the process, there was no steaming. Uh, you just cook it it will not be well received. You must do a proper steaming with a certain amount of hydrochloric added. Then only the acceptance of the consumers are at, at par with the ordinary um, oil fried noodles. Okay. Uh, for the salt substitute, same thing. Um, we do not see any uh, 
any significant difference between uh, salt substitute or ordinary uh, sodium chloride white salted noodles. They can accept that. And last question, Dr. Azar. It seems that competition of noodles in the market is like competition of cell phones that manufacturers must stay vigilant of the changes in order to be at par with their competitors. Do you have government agency that supports the researches of private companies that are producing noodles? That's from Mam Eleanor Cebu. Yes, on behalf of my government. <laughs> Actually, there are many uh, uh, funding uh, or I don't know some grant being being offered to the uh, all manufacturers, including the noodle manufacturers, if they want to improve uh, quality, if they want to bring in new technology, if they have um, new ideas for development, they have simply have to apply. But it's not it's not exactly uh, just for noodles for. For all, for all uh, kind of manufacturing, okay. So sometimes they, they have to work with us, uh, the the innovators, um, and how how we help them to bring the technology into realization in the manufacturing. Okay, Kathleen. Thank you, Dr. Azar. Uh, I think if I would summarize your talk, if something that I really like about what you said is that. Uh, you don't just you're not just concerned about the good health, about addressing hunger, but the number 12 of the SDG, which is we have to be responsible in terms of cons uh, of our consumption. So we make it not just cost effective, but we make it uh, friendly to our environment as well. And also you've mentioned that when you change a system, you have to adjust the process and we have to adjust the formulation. And everything comes from a crazy idea, like what you said, <laughs> Dr. Azar. So the funding, like what you've said, uh, it can... Uh, you can actually go to your government. And I think in the Philippines, we also have several uh, studies also uh, related on how to improve our um, food consumption or our food system as a whole. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Azar. And now we will be awarding your uh, uh, certificate of appreciation. And the certificate reads... Uh, the Certificate of Appreciation is given to Dato Dr. Azar Mat Iesa uh, of University Science Malaysia for sharing your time, knowledge, and expertise as speaker during the second Helen Ocampo Memorial Lecture Series entitled Gut Fiber, a webinar on fiber as functional food component to improve gut health. Held online via USD Zoom and YouTube channel of the USD College of Education, given this 26th day of June in the year of our Lord, 20, uh, 2021, signed by Miss Essence Del Castillo, by yours truly, by our Dean Associate Professor Pilar Romero, and by our Regent, Reverend Father Max Gatela. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Azar. And we look forward to meeting you personally after this pandemic in our university, or we can also visit you in University Science Malaysia. Once again, thank you so much and a virtual clap for Dr. Azar. Thank you very much, Dr. Azar. And now, uh, before we have our closing remarks, uh, we would just like to remind those who are on our YouTube channel that we will be posting in a while our evaluation, our QR code as our evaluation form. It will be flashed on your screen. And to give her closing remarks, may I call on the Dean of the College of Education, Associate Professor Pilar I. Romero, LPT, PhD. Good afternoon, or still good morning. <laughs> okay, it's still good morning. Um, it, it has been a wonderful uh, morning, and I'm, I'm happy um, to be with you and to be listening to our expert speakers and also the dynamic exchange of questions and answers um, in this morning's conference. 
um, let me just ask a question. Have you heard of the expression, no guts, no glory? This means that it would take courage or guts to achieve success. Or perhaps you have at one point in your life said, I could feel it in my gut, which means that you are certain that something is happening. Perhaps your significant other is playing on the side, even if you may not have direct evidence to support it. Still another, we say, I was hit at the gut level, meaning that something touched us to our core and we are moved to action. In the gospel, when Jesus saw the people like a ship without a shepherd, he felt pain in his gut and was moved by compassion to minister to them. The figurative use of God points to the truth that central to our affective life and even to our social relationships. To speak at the God level is to be honest and sincere. To have God's is to have courage and determination. On the other hand, as I was listening to the um, second talk, I, I thought of salt. Salt is also used in a figurative sense. The way it is used in the gospel. To be salt of the earth is to add flavor to the life of the people around us through our witnessing to love. But we also know that too much salt destroys flavor and that becomes harmful. Looking at God and salt in this figurative sense and the way our speakers expertly explain to us their role to our health would lead us to see how they are essential to our overall well-being. Looking at two perspectives, the scientific and the figurative perspectives would lead us to see the need for body, heart, and spirit dynamic. When these are taken care of, the body, the heart, and the spirit, then we can attain optimum health. At this point, I would like to heartily and sincerely thank our speakers for the time they spent with us for sharing their expertise selflessly to make this understand undertaking truly meaningful. I also would like to thank the organizers of this conference, the Nutrition and Dietetics Department and the Food Technology Department for coming up again with a very worthy endeavor. And to all our audiences for your presence and also for contributing to this conference by your questions, by your queries, and by, by your attentiveness, my heartfelt thanks. Thank you so much, Dean Pilar, for also gracing our uh, event. And even pre-pandemic, Dean Pilar really stays all throughout our uh, seminar. So thank you so much, Dean, for always supporting our departments. So uh, with that, uh, we'll show now the QR code for those who are on YouTube. We have almost around uh, 100 also on YouTube. And of course, uh, to get your certificate, you have to, uh, you have to of course, uh, fill out our post-evaluation form. 
Okay, for we also received several questions actually for uh, Dr. Azar and Dr. Edraline. So we were not able to ask those questions, but definitely we'll forward those to their email addresses so they can also uh, send the, the answers to your queries. So thank you. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning. And we look forward to another a uh, Helen Memorial Ocampo lecture next year live. We hope we are praying so hard that it will be an actual Helen Ocampo Memorial lecture in our university. And to close our session, we will now be singing the USD hymn. Once again, thank you so much and happy lunch here in the Philippines. Thank you. Kat, can we have a picture of the organizers? Ah, uh, yes, Pudin. May we request the faculty members uh, yes, uh, to yes. turn on your camera, guys, so that we'll have a picture with Dean. Thank you, Pudin. Welcome. Thank you also from the College of Science. Thank you so much po, for attending. Hi, so Dr. Sagum is still here. Thank you, ma'am, for attending. <laughs> See, Dr. Fortune. Dr. Fortune, are you still here po? Parang Parang wala na po. Nag-leave na po yata din. Sige. Sige, ma'am, floor. Ikaw na lang uli po ang mag-cue, ma'am, floor. Sure po. Okay. So, okay but let's start our picture taking. One, two, three, smile. Okay, another one po. One, two, three, smile. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much po. po. Thank you so much, Dr. Azar. See you in Pinang, Dr. Thank Azar. Dr. Azar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Congratulations nice. to all of you. Be safe. Be safe po. Thank you, Dean. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dean. Bye -bye. Bye -bye, I'm Cherry. Thank you for the live stream. Cherry. You're welcome. Bye -bye. I-end ko na po. Yes po. Yes. Sir Roderick, thank you so much. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye, pa-end naman.